as well as the Divinity School and the Department of Religious Studies. She teaches in the joint MA program in Religion and Ecology. With her husband, John Grimm, she directs the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale. Along with Brian Thomas Swim, Mary Evelyn created a multimedia project called Journey of the Universe, which includes an Emmy Award winning film. I think that's our film for tonight. Yeah. Um, a book and a DVD series of 20 interviews that Tucker did with leading scientists, educators, and environmentalists. The title is Journey Conversations. So it's my great pleasure to pass you over to Dr. Mary Evelyn. The main theme is this integral ecology, namely social justice and ecological care, how these come together. And that has been a challenge. It's been a challenge for the church. It's been a challenge for science to put together people and the planet. And that integral ecology is the key contribution of Laudato Si, among many contributions. OK, so this encyclical, for those of us who've worked for two decades in religion and ecology, is the most important document in religion and ecology by far, and probably the most important document in our lifetime in that regard. And I hope that I'll unpack some of that. I'm sure you feel that already as you've read it. Um, the goals of the encyclical, as you probably know, the short-term goal was to affect the UN climate talks in Paris in December of 2015. Um, and it did. One of our faculty at Yale said, the encyclical was a main reason why we got the climate agreement, which are voluntary agreements to reduce carbon uh, emissions. Now, we won't talk about how we've withdrawn, <laughs> but we can also say the long-term objective is ecological conversion of people around the planet. That's the call of Laudato Si. Now, the audience certainly is over a billion Catholics, for sure, but Pope Francis makes it clear it's Christians, so you've got two billion Christians altogether. Other religious communities have responded to this. The Muslims have written a statement of support, the Buddhists, the Jewish community. Every religious community has said why this is important. But I also want to just underscore, and this is important for people in religious communities like the Carmelites, the academic communities are also responding. And this is an important bridge from religion to science, okay? A huge bridge. Now, let me just give you an example. At Yale, at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, a hundred-year-old school, Aldo Leopold graduated from there, and produced most of our um, key environmentalists over the last century. Our dean, secular dean, Peter Crane, a wonderful botanist, was head of Kew Botanical Gardens, the Field Museum here in Chicago. Before the encyclical came out in April of 2015, he said to my husband and mate, John Grimm, um, he said, we've got to do something at Yale on the encyclical, even if it wasn't coming out till June. And it's just two years now, you know, June 18th that it came out. So we had a huge um, panel discussion, people from the law school, people from the forestry school, divinity school, et cetera, on the importance of Laudato Si at Yale, highly secular place, even before it came out. You see how excited people ha are about this? So. The second thing is the environmental, or down at the bottom here, the environmental community is responding very favorably as well. ESA means the Ecological Society of America, 10,000 ecologists, the best that we have from all of the ecological sciences. The year it came out in August in Baltimore, that society endorsed the papal encyclical, the president, the past president, and future president unprecedented move. It had a ripple effect in the other science uh, societies as well. 
We had two days of panels on religion and ecology there. So there's an opening with science, and I think we've got a very bright opening here at Loyola with Nancy Tuckman and all the work that she's been doing, uh, bringing together science and religion in a healing earth textbook, bringing all the, J the Jesuit communities here to work on this. I'll say something more, but I really want to give a huge shout out to what's happening right here at Loyola for the encyclical and for this integral ecology. And finally, <clears throat> I, was just, I just came back on Friday from a conference um, in Norway sponsored by the Norwegian government, the Ministry of the Environment, United Nations Development Program on, it's called Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. It had indigenous peoples from the Congo, from Amazonia and Brazil, from Indonesia. It had religious leaders, including the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Monsignor Sarando there, it scientists, government people, and so on. This was a watershed of this movement of religion and ecology. Laudato Si was mentioned over and over again. Okay? Nor the Norwegian government over the last 12 years has given $4 billion to rainforest forest protection, but they realize they can't do it by science and policy and government alone. They've just scolded the president of Brazil, as you probably saw, for not following through. The destruction of the rainforest is still happening. So they want the religious communities to participate. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. Okay? It's a very, very exciting moment. So I want to just go um, a little bit back and say certainly there was leadership moving towards uh, Laudato Si. Uh, John Paul II did a encyclical 100 years after Leo's Rerum Novarum, one of the great social justice encyclicals on labor and so on of, of Pope Leo. And what he said in 1991, he was trying to reconfigure dominion, this very problematic idea from Genesis, to stewardship um, and to cooperative labor. Okay? The church, of course, has been very strong on this sense of dignity of labor, dignity of humans. But what is stewardship? We are redefining that all across the board. That's the work of some theologians and ethicists, and it's happening rapidly. And I would suggest stewardship is a first step, but we have a long way to go on what is care for the planet in a really comprehensive way. So Benedict um, as well, sometimes he was even called the Green Pope. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, but in this encyclical, he highlighted the duty to the poor, the responsibility to future generations, which is the cry of the encyclical, the cry of environmental degradation. He also highlights wise use of nature, which sometimes is used by the business community to justify the greening of business. It, it has its uh, problems and its promise. He highlights this um, wonderful term, the grammar of nature. And um, natural law teaching in the Catholic Church, I think, is a great uh, asset in these types of discussions. Thomas Berry, my teacher, I hope some of you have heard of, how many of you have heard of Thomas Berry? Okay, so he's, you know, really one of the leading thinkers in, in this line and uh, was a great inspiration for us, of course. So nature is not a collection of objects, but a communion of subjects. I'm heard, sure you've heard this term, that nature is not something to be just exploited or objectified. It's a communion of subjects, and this term appears in the encyclical. Now, another influence, how many of you have heard of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew? Great. <laughs> um, his inspiration for this encyclical, his friendship with Pope Francis is quite extraordinary and is a story that needs to be told even more broadly. So he did a series over 15 years of symposium on religion, science, and environment focused on water issues. Uh, we went on, on many of these, most of them, um, and it was highlighting the science, UN people, largely European community, which is way ahead of us on many of these issues, um, and the importance of an ethics and spirituality for the environment. Now, one of the highlights of these trips um, was in the Amazon, where the patriarch said, 
uh, we, um, we were all on boats in all of these symposium, um, and he brought it out into the middle of the Amazon, and around it were smaller boats, and he apologized to indigenous peoples of the Amazon for conversion, for lack of respect for their tradition, uh, for some of the abuses that the church, uh, the Chris Christian churches have done to indigenous peoples. This was a big issue at the conference in Norway as well. Um, that spirit has been taken up by Pope Francis. Are you aware that Pope Francis apologized in both Bolivia and Colombia for treatment of indigenous peoples by the churches? Um, and he's going back in September and January to Latin America. So this healing of indigenous peoples, their ways of knowing, their cultural practices is a very important part of this new integral ecology. So another key player, so June 18th, two years ago, 15, <clears throat> yeah, um, Metropolitan John Zizoulis was the great mystical, as many of you are interested in the mystical traditions uh, in the church, he is the great mystical inspiration for the patriarch Bartholomew. And it was his vision, he's a theologian as well, of this integrated, interdependent um, sense of the earth as divine, the earth as an icon shining through uh, the light of a divine spirit. So who was at the Vatican to bring out the encyclical three years ago? Not the Pope, okay, but John Zizoulis was there as a representative of the Orthodox Church and this tremendous affirmation of creation that they have in their theology. Uh, we have a sacramental sense in the Catholic Church, but the Orthodox have a tremendous cosmological spirituality for creation. So that went directly into the second chapter of the encyclical, the promise of the gospel of creation with this profound sense of the mystery of the universe, the harmony of creation in each creature, the interdependence of all life, and a call to a universal communion, which is what the Pope uh, speaks of. And in that chapter, it says, the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity. So this is a legacy for all humanity. I love the word trusteeship, which is actually what the Islamic community uses. And at the uh, UN, the trusteeship council room is still being thought about as to what it should really represent in the 21st century. And to me and to others, it should represent a trusteeship, not for its past role of colonization, but for the future of the planet, you see. And that's the idea, the, the legacy. If we have great cultural institutions like you do here in Chicago, and I'm from New York, we want to care for those cultural institutions, support them, and so on. It's the same thing here of the patrimony of creation. So <clears throat> Han, the other, the second person who was there was a very well-respected scientist from Germany. He's head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, which has over a thousand scientists connected to it, supported by the German government, one of the oldest science institutes for climate impact research studies, he was there. The Pope and the Pontifical Academy of Science was a key player in all of this. Science is at the center of this encyclical, and it actually begins, which I'll speak about. Um, now, <clears throat> the encyclical begins with the problems we are facing. That is the first chapter, a very science and ecologically based chapter. <clears throat> it starts with pollution and climate change. Um, it talks about water and the sacredness of water. Those of us who are thinking of Flint, Michigan or Standing Rock are reflecting on why is water so important. And to me, the issue for the 21st century is by far and away going to be water. Are we going to be part of the articulation of the sacredness of water? That's the call of this encyclical. Um, biodiversity loss, the Pope refers to this in several passages. How many of you might be aware that we are in a sixth extinction period? Okay, so what is it? That's the question, isn't it? <clears throat> we have had five extinctions in the evolutionary process before now, 
The last one was caused, caused by a meteor hitting the Yucatan Peninsula, and the dinosaurs uh, went extinct after <clears throat> a huge hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of years. We are at the end of the Cenozoic era of 65 million years of life, and we are losing species because for a whole variety of reasons, that is called a six extinction period. We are the cause of it, not radical climate change like the ice ages or, a <clears throat> uh, or the Yucatan uh, explosion and so on. On the Hall of the Natural History Museum in New York, it says in the Hall of Biodiversity, we are in the midst of a six extinction period, but we can stem the tide of destruction. Let us think in our religious communities, what is the morning of life in all of its forms? We have a long way to go and to create rituals of mourning, of loss, of extinction. It's a huge, huge uh, way forward. The next generation is going to have to inherit a diminished planet, and that is part of the challenge of the encyclical. Now, this chapter also deals with the breakdown of society, the quality of life. Um, he, calls, he says, we've created filth, we've created a throwaway society, um, and we have created, as we know, massive inequity, not only in this country, but around the world. And that is the challenge uh, right at the beginning of this encyclical. Um, <clears throat> now, whoops. Mm. Okay. Um, the third person who was there at the Vatican was Cardinal Turkson. I'm sure you've heard of Cardinal Turkson from Ghana, um, and he has a very strong role in the encyclical. Um, and this chapter three deals with the human roots of the ecological crisis, as the Pontifical Academy of Justice and Peace does. This is saying that the crisis and the effects of modern anthropocentrism and dominion are tremendously problematic. Anthropocentrism, the centering of everything on humans, our need, our greed, um, <clears throat> our use, our extraction, our exploitation. And I was rereading the encyclical this morning. The words are fascinating. Excessive environmentalism, misplaced environmentalism, distorted environmentalism. This is a huge problem. It's a problem for all the world's religions. Is this about simply salvation of humans and God? Is it simply about human-human relations? What has happened to human-earth relations, you see? And the challenge here is a decentering of the human as the focus of everything and the recentering of humans within an earth community, within a cosmic community, within the life community. That is the challenge. That is what our young people are searching for. Where do they belong? Um, and that's what Journey of the Universe is about as well that you'll see tonight. Um, so the objectification of nature and of humans is, the, is part of the problem that the Pope is identifying especially with unlimited growth and extractive industries, mining, all the fossil fuel industries. He comes over and over again to critique progress, to critique this sense unlimited economic growth is the way forward. Um, <clears throat> he is saying we have got to rethink progress. This is what our teacher Thomas Berry was saying almost 40 years ago. We need a new story. We need a new dream. And the Pope's words, we need a cultural revolution. Who would have thought in our lifetime from the Vatican a call for a cultural revolution? It's a radical call, and there's no um, watering it down. So this sense, then, of nature is here for us to use. If we take it to the level of what is the American dream, progress, more stuff, materialism, use of nature, we are at the end of a very broken dream, of a dream that simply has no future. Why are we the most addicted society in the world? With opioids, with alcohol, with other drugs. Because materialism has no future 
has no vision, has no spiritual sense of renewal. The emptiness of modernity is confronting us, and that is what the Pope is also saying. And we can see this, by the way, around the world. China has the same issues, um, and there's a whole resurgence of religion in China as well. Okay, <clears throat> so the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, where Cardinal Turkson is a part, um, is suggesting that the moral imperative of all peoples is to be protectors of the environment that care for creation as a virtue in its own right. You see, we need new virtues. We need ecological virtues. What does it mean to really care for creation, to say every species has its dignity? And the Pope says this over and over again. We have to value ecosystems and species for their intrinsic value, not just their use to humans, even for medicine or building or whatever. There's an intrinsic beauty and complexity to nature itself. So the need for a new global solidarity to direct our search for the common good is what he's speaking about. And this new synthesis is integral ecology. Um, the common good is something we have lost sight of in the US in particular. I just came back from, as I said, Norway. The Scandinavian countries understand what is the social net of people being cared for, what is the ecological net of care. It's a completely different understanding. The EU is so far ahead of us in understanding what is the common good. I'm not saying they're perfect, but I am suggesting what the Pope is criticizing is hyper-modernity, excessive individualism, liberty for the individual alone. We need to reinvent, rediscover an earth community and a sense of a common good. There's no future without a shared future, and that is what is at stake at this particular point in history. Okay, so those were the three people at the Vatican. It was ecumenical with the, with the uh, Orthodox Church, it was scientific with Schulnuberger, and um, it was p at the heart of the justice and peace of the Catholic Church with Turkson. Now, Leonardo Boff, I'm sure you've heard of Leonardo as one of the leading liberation theologians from Latin America, um, and his phrase, cry of the earth, cry of the poor, is over and over again in this encyclical. But it was Thomas Berry who really influenced Leonardo to say early on to many of the liberation theologians, you can't save people, you can't help the poor without the land, without the ecological basis. If, if there's no fresh water, if the soil is tox toxified, if our food safety is of such a level that our health has been infected. Most of you in this room Cancer was not such an issue as it is now. How many of you have friends or family who have cancer? Everyone in this room, I suspect. You see, that is the effect of toxicities, of a whole range of chemicals in our environment. Uh, so Leonardo changed his sensibility. We've been doing from Orbis books at Mary Knoll a series on ecology and justice for about 20 years. You can see right in the middle there, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor, Leonardo's book. You can see Thomas Berry's book, Christian Future in the Face of Earth, Brian Swim's book, The Hidden Heart of the Cosmos, Just Water, The in Voice of Indigenous Peoples, and Larry Rasmussen, a tremendous Lutheran theologian, uh, ethicist, earth community, and earth ethics. So, integral ecology, then chapter four in the encyclical, is trying to bring together ecology, economics, and equity. Um, the principle of the common good that I've spoken about is what he calls us towards. Solidarity with the poor, but intergenerational justice, as native people will, would say, we make decisions for seven generations into the future. That is a vision that I, as a teacher, we have the most wonderful students at Yale. I feel so blessed to have them. Their creativity, their concerns are right before us every day. I say we have to have an intergenerational handshake with you and your generation. So Catholic social teachings are now being expanded to the earth. And I have to put in 
I'm, I was deeply influenced by Catholic social justice teaching. I was very involved in civil rights. I went to Trinity in Washington, D.C. Nancy Pelosi was a few years ahead of me. Kathleen Sebelius, who was head of health and human service. We were so involved with the social justice issues and the anti-Vietnam War. But the church has taken a while to get to the environment um, as part of it. And that's why the excessive anthropocentrism needs to be reconfigured. Um, so it's eco-justice, people and planet together. So the encyclical also invites us all to lines of approach and action through dialogue. The Pope is remarkable about dialogue. And he's saying we in the church don't have all the answers. That's why we need to look to scientists, to people in law and public policy and new technologies and so on. So this dialogue he's calling for is on an international, national, and local level. Change can happen in institutions that you're part of, and they go all the way up to the UN and so on. And I know the Carmelites have an NGO presence at the UN, which I think is, is terrific. So politics and economy for human fulfillment, not just for uh, personal power and aggrandizement. Redefining, redefining progress. There's a whole institute called Redefining Progress, actually, out in the Berkeley area. Development, sustainable development. How many of you heard, have heard of sustainable development? This is, again, what the UN has been trying to push forward, sustainable development goals that integrate justice for humans, but also um, the flourishing of planetary systems. So this new invitation of religion and science to come together on care for our common home, the beautiful subtitle of this encyclical. Um, so we need interreligious cooperation and interdisciplinary cooperation. And I can tell you stories of how difficult this is to do in non-religious institutions. I did my degree at, at Columbia, spent time at Harvard on these conference series over three years, at Berkeley, and, and now at Yale. This is not easy because these are institutions which have religion <laughs> over there. Um, and how we are going to really create partners across disciplines is a great challenge. And it's again why I sing the praises of what Nancy Tuckman has done here and bringing together this conversation in a very serious way. It is perhaps one of the most needed things within academia because it creates a split, a schizophrenia in our students. I'll talk about that tonight with the Journey of the Universe uh, film. Okay. So the final chapter of the final chapter of the encyclical goes ecological education and spirituality. Again, what Loyola is trying to do. This new synthesis. So the Pope is calling for new lifestyles within a web of relations, a covenant between humanity and nature, this beautiful word of a covenant. Ecological conversion is his term. Um, it's an awakening that he keeps saying over and over again. So Loyola is I really want to say it's one of the most important efforts because if Jesuit education can get a hold of Laudato Si, can get a hold of an integral ecology, and that's what's happening in these invitations in March, the last four years, to bring together the Jesuit universities across the U.S., the eco-justice network of Jesuits. This is the largest educational system in the world, really. And if that can be transformed, there's tremendous change for this awakening of a new consciousness and conscience. You see, that's what we need, a consciousness for how we're part of an earth community and a conscience to respond to that through people the who are suffering, the poor, the vulnerable, but also ecosystems that are being degraded. It has to break our hearts when we see rainforests being absolutely destroyed, the, uh, the, the deforestation, the loss of biodiversity, it's heartbreaking. And that has to be part of our moral conscience, you see. So um, the Pope says, this is an authentic humanity calling for a new synthesis. And there's a beautiful phrase there about this uh, calling to humanity. He says it's almost like mist coming under the door, you know, calling to us. It's really, a, he's got an amazing poetic imagination to put this uh, into words that touch us in the heart, not just our mind. Now, I'm going to conclude with a few other influences in the encyclical. Of course, 
Isn't it remarkable that he is the first pope to take the name of Francis? It's just astonishing, right? I'm sure many of you in the Carmelite spirituality draw on, on, on St. Francis of Assisi as well. This is a saint, even a shamanic figure almost, in his relationship with nature. My husband studies Native American traditions. We're adopted into the Crow tribe. We've been with Native peoples in many parts of the world. The sense of a cosmovision of this living universe that we come out of. Why was it he could talk with birds and plants and the animals and the wolf and so on, right? This is a profound indigenous sensibility all over the world. We have a great deal to learn from it. And Francis, of course, represented it in astonishing ways, absolutely astonishing ways. So this influence is absolutely explicit in the encyclical. Mother Earth, that is amazing you see, that this would be in the encyclical. This is not paganism. This is creation named by many people. Pachamama is the phrase for Mother Earth across Latin America. And Latin American peoples have picked this up in remarkable ways, beautiful ways, okay? So the canticle to Brother Sun and Sister Moon is an expression of this. Everything is speaking of the divine. These are voices of the divine. And Thomas Berry would say, if we lose these voices, if we lose, as Rachel Carson understood, if we lose birds in the spring due to DT, DDT and toxification, we are, ha are having a silent spring. And Thomas Berry would say, it's the loss of a divine voice as we lose these species. They are singing to us. And there's an explosion of animal behavior studies that is giving us a vision of the languages of creation, the languages of the dolphins, the communication of whales, the migrating patterns of salmon upriver to where they were born, the in intuitive understanding of these species all across the, the planet, migrations of turtles, of caribou across the northern regions of Canada, and so on. There's language, there's an aliveness, there's intelligences across these communities of life, across these ecosystems. So Bonaventure, one of the great Franciscans, of course, spoke of the mind's path to God, that this grammar of nature that Benedict spoke of, this, this patterning of nature leads us back to the divine. That's what the mind's path to God is about. It's an amazing sense of a spiritual path to the divine. So what is all of this calling us to? It's not just beauty alone, but it's a profound sense that awe cause, calls us to action. Awe is the most profound religious sensibility. And I'm sure when it comes rushing into your life in a spiritual moment or in a sunset or on a hillside, it lights us up, right? We are in touch with something so profound. So awe evokes action. Reverence evokes responsibility. Because reverence, we are in the face of such mystery in terms of these ecosystems. We barely understand their complexity. But it's got to move us towards responsibility for their continuity. Um, and kinship, such as St. Francis with all of the animal life, in invokes universal solidarity. The Pope refers explicitly to kinship, you see? This is bringing forward movements that have been growing in our society and elsewhere around the planet of awe, of reverence, and of kinship. Now, how many of you have read Teilhard de Chardin? Wonderful. My husband and I, we've just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the American Teilhard Association. He's been president for 30 years, and I've been his vice president, along with Brian Swim. So Teilhard de Chardin, um, is a tremendous inspiration. Certainly for the encyclical, he's mentioned only in a footnote, but he's there. And at a meeting in November at the Pontifical Academy, uh, the head of it began with Teilhard and his importance. And again tonight, hopefully we'll talk about how Teilhard has certainly inspired this journey of the universe, film and book. How can we tell this unfolding of 14 billion years of cosmic 
Earth and human evolution in a way that says the future of it is in our hands for the decisions that we will be making. So we need that long scale perspective of the divine milieu that Teilhard spoke about over and over again. When he was out in the Ordos Desert um, offering mass, he was offering it with the elements and saying matter itself is part of this consecration moment. His profound mystical vision is absolutely central to this encyclical and also journey of the universe. <laughs> Thomas Berry, how many of you have read some of his works? So he was the past president of the American Teilhard Association. He's been perhaps the leading spokesperson for many, many years. He died in 2009 for an eco-spirituality. And we can talk more about him um, tonight as well. Because he took Teilhard is not easy to read. The phenomenon of man is a, is a big mouthful. Um, the hymn of the universe, divine milieu, the letters, the making of a mind, his letters give us the sense of his humanness and his compassion for those who are suffering, including those in his family who were very, very ill. So Teilhard is he's a big thinker and uh, quite a fantastic writer, but Thomas Berry said we have to take this big evolutionary uh, science story, because uh, Teilhard was a Jesuit, but also a scientist. He says, we need to make it into story. We need to have it accessible to people. And that's where he had this idea of a new story um, that will inspire people to this consciousness change and conscience change. Again, tonight we'll talk more about it. Um, and that's why we made this film, The Journey of the Universe, this book from Yale. I'm very happy to give you a password protected site for using Journey of the Universe and the conversations um, you know, after the conference and so on. Use it with your family, your friends, your communities, however you may wish. We actually have online classes for it now. There's about 16,000 people watching it all over the world. It's been translated into many different languages because this yearning for how are we part of a larger community is exploding, um, despite uh, news to the contrary as well. We're in this creative tension moment. Um, so the ways forward, as I was just mentioning, the journey of the universe, these courses that are online, it's a new story for this new integral ecology. Um, it's being translated, all these courses being translated into Chinese this summer, and we'll release them in the fall. How many of you know the Earth Charter? Okay, the Earth Charter came out of the Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio, and it said we needed to put together a sense of cosmology, the long-scale story, but also ecology, justice, and peace. That's the heart of the Earth Charter. And Gorbachev said we need a global ethics for sustainable development for the future of the planet. That's where the Earth Charter uh, arose. I was part of the drafting committee. It was almost 10 years in the making. It was the most negotiated civil society document that we have, really. So this putting together of these many streams um, has really created what I like to call not just a declaration of independence of the individual, but of interdependence for the Earth community, for the global planetary community. Education, this healing Earth, you can find it online. 90 uh, academics and others have weighed in on this, of key problems of water, of biodiversity, the things we've been mentioning um, that can be used for education. Um, the protests that we're all aware of Standing Rock, right, out in North Dakota. My husband's from North Dakota. This was remarkable, you know, truly remarkable, because it came out, water is sacred, water is life. That's a cosmological idea. We are a water planet. And even if we discover the possibility of water on other planets, this is a life-giving planet. This is what makes it unique, and it's sacred. You see, that's the power of that message over and over again, and it was sustained by rituals, by prayers, birthed by young people, incidentally. And although that was shut down, the spirit of Standing Rock, you see, of our common home and our future, has exploded all across North America, um, both in terms of protest, in terms of prayer, in terms of grounding in the sacredness of the earth. 
So, um, I'm going to conclude with a beautiful passage from Einstein. A human being is a part of a whole called by us universe. A part limited in time and space, he or she experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. That's the message of Laudato Si and in integral ecology. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.